Well, welcome everybody. It's great to see you here. Um, in the last few years, we've seen some revolutionary breakthroughs in the medical world. We've gone from one size fits all to targeted treatment therapies for certain cancers, genetic testing to help determine individualized treatment, minimally invasive surgeries for even the most complicated cardiac cases, new drugs that have offered hope and improvement in quality of life to so many, and the list goes on and on. Well, today we will hear about how stem cell research has led and we hope will continue to lead to exciting medical advances that will benefit the world. I'm pleased to introduce Susan L. Solomon, founder and CEO of the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute, the world's leading not-for-profit research institute dedicated to translating cutting-edge stem cell research into clinical breakthroughs. A veteran healthcare advocate, Ms. Solomon serves on the boards of a number of prominent diabetes and regenerative medicine organizations. She has received numerous awards for her work in the New York Stem Cell Foundation, including the New York State Women of Excellence Award from the Governor of New York, the Triumph Award from the Brooke Ellison Foundation, and recognition as a living landmark from the New York Landmarks Conservancy. A lawyer by training and a chief executive and entrepreneur by experience, Ms. Solomon has decades of leadership experience that have helped build the New York Stem Cell Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Susan Solomon today. Thanks so much, Dennis and Sheila. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm very pleased the weather uh, cooperated and it's a little bit cloudy. Uh, stem cell research uh, has been a passion of mine for many, many years. Stem cell research was uh, identified first in animals uh, decades ago, but only in 1998 in human cells. That's really important to, to remember. I have to remind myself of that when I get frustrated because I want things to be moving faster. But in fact, it is a very, very new field. So there's a tremendous amount of talk about stem cell research. Uh, in fact, one of the challenges that we have is really delivering the message that there's tremendous promise. Some of the promise is being realized, but there also, as with anything new, um, is a lot of hype. So one of my goals uh, this afternoon is to help you uh, understand what questions you can ask to cut through some of that hype and, uh, and really figure out for yourself uh, what, is, um, what is realistic uh, and what the timeline is. So there's a lot of talk about precision medicine and uh, in general, uh, stem cells <coughs> in particular. And the reason is that when you think about precision medicine, you're really talking about, um, as Sheila said, uh, a different approach, a personalized approach that is quite different from the sort of one pill fits all world that we've been living in for a long time. Uh, it is, um, it is a, new, a new era. Uh, reducing healthcare costs, although that is going to be uh, challenging, and I'll talk about that because someone has to pay for treatments uh, as well. And the goal is really to improve the health that we currently have so that those of us um, who are, are lucky enough to be living longer and longer, uh, we want to make sure that we live a healthy life. And so uh, while there may for some uh, be a, a side benefit and uh, you could um, you know, sort of outpace your, uh, your genetic history and uh, add a few years, the goal is really to be as healthy as you possibly can be. So what is a stem cell? Uh, let me just very briefly go over it because um, it's, uh, it's not a, uh, uh, a simple topic. Um, a stem cell is basically uh, an unspecialized cell that can continually renew itself and make more of itself. So in a month, for example, we could fill up this entire room with stem cells. Um, they like to multiply. Uh, they multiply at a tremendous rate. And they also have the ability to become any kind of specialized tissue or organ uh, in the entire body. 
but there are many different types of stem cells. Uh, there are stem cells that are made from skin or blood, a little drop. Uh, we do that in our laboratory, and those are called induced pluripotent stem cells. Now that's an even newer technique that was only uh, first uh, discovered in Japan uh, in 2007 by uh, uh, Shinya Yamanaka, who won the Nobel Prize for it. Um, then there are embryonic stem cells. Um, many people remember uh, the tremendous controversy um, in, the, uh, uh, in the Bush years about embryonic stem cells. Um, but in fact, embryonic stem cells are uh, made from the uh, literally hundreds of thousands of um, IVF embryos that are languishing in uh, liquid nitrogen uh, tanks at this point, uh, often for decades. Um, and then there are cord blood stem cells. Cord blood everyone is familiar with. Uh, now a woman uh, is about to give birth, and she, uh, if she's lucky, before, but sometimes as she's being uh, you know, wheeled into um, uh, the delivery room, and she's asked, do you want to save your baby's cord blood? Um, it is, depending on who does it, it can be expensive, several thousand dollars, and then there are ongoing storage charges, and uh, a lot of people are doing it, and then a few years later, they're wondering why they're still paying the bills. Um, and uh, there are, uh, <clears throat> and I think what got cut off in that slide, uh, adult stem cells. So adult stem cells, um, actually very much like cord blood cells. They're cells that have already decided what their jobs are. So our skin uh, has its job, our brain cells have their jobs, our heart cells has its job. And the, um, the most exciting thing about pluripotent stem cells is that they can make every possible type of cell in the body. Cord blood cells, we're getting better in manipulating uh, blood from, uh, from umbilical uh, cord blood, and they can make some of the cell types. And we're involved in efforts and others uh, as well to be able to use them for those people who need uh, matches um, for transplantation for cancer. Um, they're not ideal, uh, and they have a lot of limitations. And adult stem cells, as I said, are used to um, by our bodies. Uh, that's that's what we're made up of. Is uh, uh, we're cellular beings, and they've already chosen what they're going to be. So skin cells, or now blood cells, uh, are reprogrammed with chemicals or viruses. The original reprogramming was done with um, uh, something called CMYK, which is actually the the first uh, cancer gene ever discovered. And of course, cancer. Uh, make cells multiply. So if you want to take a cell and make it multiply, it, it stands to reason. Um, we've gotten better and we don't have to use those techniques. Uh, so by basically using a few tricks with a little bit of blood and a little bit of skin, uh, an apple seed bit of skin, we can actually um, reverse that adult stem cell type. Remember, it's already chosen to be blood or skin. And we can turn it back to its very origin before it's chosen what it wants to be. So why do we care about doing that? Um, one of the reasons we care is that the study of disease typically um, until 2007, 2008, has been done in animal models. And, uh, and that's been really challenging because we there are many things that you can see from animal models, but there are many things that you cannot. So one of our scientists uh, in 2008 um, took this idea of uh, doing some tricks to a skin cell, and he said, well, what if I did that to a skin cell from uh, a group of patients that have ALS, motor neuron disease? Would I be able to basically replay their disease in a dish and see what was going wrong, and more importantly, find ways to intervene, whether it's drugs or otherwise. And sure enough, um, he found that actually uh, ALS made people sick in a very different way than had been understood. People thought that spontaneously uh, the, the brain cells, the, the motor neurons affected, just simply gave up and began to die, in effect committed suicide. But actually there's another kind of cell that you couldn't see in a, in a rodent model, um, which uh, is called a glial cell, and it acted as a sniper. It started sending out toxic material. So why is that exciting? That's exciting because 
then we could look for drugs to both support the cells that are being attacked, but also find a way to take out the sniper. And we actually have several trials now uh, that are, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, that are enrolling patients and um, they're going pretty well. So um, the, uh, the goal of, uh, of stem cells is one, to be able to have a window into a living human being and understand the root cause of disease in human cells. This is really, this is a first. Uh, it, it began um, with uh, uh, Kevin Egan's discovery in, uh, uh, at NYSIF in 2008, and it really has uh, continued. Again, it also gives us the opportunity to work in human cells and not mouse cells. We are not mice. Um, mice have taught us a lot, uh, but we are very, very different, and particularly in diseases of the immune system. Uh, the immune system of a human being is really one of the things that distinguishes us from animals. Uh, and then, as I'm sure uh, many of you, uh, if not all of you, are aware, diseases affect people differently. Uh, you can have three people diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and their symptoms uh, and the course of their disease can vary pretty profoundly. Um, and then they can be given drugs and the drugs can have a very, very different effect uh, person to person. Um, before stem cells, we didn't have any tools to really parse that out. And that's why uh, I think it was, uh, I, think, I still think it's important, but it was extremely important to go to a doctor that you had a rapport with because um, every time something was prescribed for you, the information that uh, your clinician had just by knowing you that history, that's the art part of medicine as opposed to the science, um, was and still is equally important. So the other thing that we can do with stem cells besides model uh, the tissue is to test drugs. And why would we do that? We would do that to find out not only what drug uh, would or wouldn't or what, um, what molecule that gets turned into a drug could potentially stop or slow a disease, but also to find out whether it would have a negative effect on a particular part of the body. So there's a drug that you may be familiar with uh, called Vioxx, and that was a drug for arthritis. Uh, it helped a tremendous number of people, but for some people who had a particular mutation uh, in their um, heart rhythm, it actually was a disaster. And although that was um, not the majority of people who were taking the drug and doing really well, uh, the drug had to be completely withdrawn. No one got to have it. Uh, it was a, you know, a debacle uh, for the drug company. Why do we care about that? We care about that because those lost dollars end up finding their way into either reduced research or higher prices. So um, regenerative medicine uh, is another term that you've heard, and it basically is the use of laboratory-grown human cells or tissue to treat uh, parts of our body that are sick or injured. Um, and when we do that specifically for each person, that's called uh, precision medicine. So using stem cells from the various sources, uh, IPS, the induced uh, potent cells, the blastocyst, uh, which, is, which comes from uh, those uh, tens of uh, hundreds of thousands of um, IVF uh, embryos that are floating around in liquid nitrogen for decades, uh, and somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is a, a, another technique. Um, and we use them for developmental biology, drug discovery, cell replacement therapy, and understanding the mechanism of disease. So the applications are tremendous. Cancer immunotherapy, I would imagine a show of hands, is there anybody who has not heard of cancer immunotherapy? So news spreads really fast. Uh, that was particularly good news. Um, and it's very, very recent. The first CAR T uh, transplants were only done a couple of years ago. I think it's about three years ago. And uh, it was a very high risk strategy actually a strategy that a researcher, Steven Rosenberg, at the NIH uh, has been pursuing for decades, which is the notion that you could um, harness the body's own immune system uh, to, to basically 
um, go through the body and seek and destroy those things that didn't belong there. Basically say, get out of my body. You don't belong here. And in order to do that, um, a particular kind of uh, cell was used. And actually, it's called um, a CAR T cell. It's, a, it's an armored cell. Um, and, uh, and that cell was uh, um, redesigned uh, in the laboratory so that it would have basically a homing device. And it knew where to go and it would attack the cancer cells. Um, that has been uh, tremendously successful in blood cancers. Um, solid tumor cancers are different. Those trials are now, and uh, uh, we have um, uh, at NICIF and in the NICIF family um, a number of people who are, uh, are waiting anxiously for those early, early trials uh, in solid tumors to be approved. And they're making their way through the regulatory pathway, which is another question because a real, when you're talking about a therapy um, like CAR T therapy or cancer immunotherapy, not everyone survives. Uh, in the very early days, it was done in Children's Hospital um, in, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. That was uh, some of the first work that was done. And uh, fortunately, the, um, one of the uh, uh, physicians that was on call had a child of their own who had uh, a very severe form of rheumatoid arthritis. And when they saw this young patient have um, have an immune system that went completely into overdrive and was going to overwhelm that patient, um, this physician said, okay, why don't I go to this other tool chest and see if I can take some of what I've learned from damping down the immune system. So basically, um, that field is learning how not only to step on the gas, to rev up the immune system, but how to actually modulate it. Uh, cardiovascular disease, um, there have been for at least 10 years uh, experiments to inject heart cells directly into people's hearts. Um, in the early days, uh, there, was, um, uh, there was hope that because cells, they originally left on their own, stem cells will turn into brain cells. Uh, but uh, much like, um, like honeybees, they organize themselves and they say, okay, I'll be brain, you'll be stomach, you know, you'll be heart. And uh, so we thought they'd be clever enough so that the heart cells could actually go right to the heart. Um, unfortunately, it is as though we decided we were going to grow a garden right here on this beautiful floor. This is a beautiful floor, but if we just drop seeds on it, they're going to say, where am I? And they're not going to survive. So um, additional techniques uh, have been developed uh, and are in trial now. We're basically um, the same way with your garden. You would uh, you'd put down some uh, uh, fertilizer and some really good soil, and you would feed it, um, creating scaffolds so that these cells are not just dropped into the body so they've landed on Mars, uh, but they actually um, have a way to acclimate themselves. But there's something else uh, that is being used now for cardiovascular disease. It's being claimed uh, for a number of other diseases, and that is the use of stem cells that are taken from either the bone marrow or fat cells, or you may have heard of PRP, uh, where uh, blood, your own blood, is drawn, spun around in a centrifuge, and then put back to um, cure your aching knee or shoulder or whatever. There's no science that says that is going to work. Um, I am, um, uh, and, and my colleagues are great believers in, uh, in the power of, uh, of placebo thinking. Um, and so God bless for those uh, for whom it works. For others, the result is, depending on uh, where they are, much more serious. Um, they lose a tremendous amount of money, and if the cells that are put into you are not purified and used for the correct purpose or taken from um, other species uh, or other individuals, uh, you can end up far worse than you are now. So if anyone suggests that you have um, a, a stem cell therapy for your knee or your aching shoulder uh, or for uh, MS, 
um, you need to first take a look at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, the FDA actually is working really, really hard to, uh, and they are up to speed to move these therapies along. There's not a conspiracy where the FDA does not want the American public to have good medicine. Um, and remember, who works at the FDA? It's people like us. So they just happen to live in a different location. Um, so they're, they're, not, uh, they're not evil people. And if you hear about a therapy that has a very large out-of-pocket cost, you have to go to another country, typically a country that you don't think of for its medical prowess. You might want to really reconsider that. Um, on the other hand, we are seeing that in some cases, these cells called mesenchymal stem cells, they do, and if they're processed properly, they seem to send out a signal that says, wake up. So if you have, um, if the plane is completely crashed and you don't have any, uh, if you have bone on bone, you have no cartilage left, um, your body is not uh, going to uh, be able to regenerate itself. But if, in fact, you are kind of on the edge and somebody injects mesenchymal stem cells or uh, PRP, not clear they could just as well inject saline solution, but it appears that the body sort of says, oh, wait a minute, I've been lazy, I'm going to wake up. So um, I, I, in my own uh, thinking, am, um, I don't, there, there is no science on this. There are, no there are many clinical trials. Uh, they all have, uh, nothing has shown that it works. What has been shown is that it done correctly, it will not hurt you. Those are safety trials. So the jury is very much uh, still out. Um, some exciting clinical trials for macular degeneration. Uh, that's something near and dear to my heart. I suspect a number of people in this room. Um, not surprisingly, because it affects the majority of people over 60. So uh, Pete Coffey, who is uh, one of our collaborating scientists, uh, and Lyndon de Cruz, a fantastic surgeon at Moorfields in London, um, they created, with actually private dollars from the US, uh, the London Project to Cure Blindness. And what they were able to do is uh, to take uh, a woman in her 80s um, who couldn't read the top line on the eye chart, and now she's five lines down. Um, so, but the problem is uh, those were very early days. It used a scaffold approach cleverly. They used a scaffold that was made out of a cataract replacement lens. I personally love that story because you know, if you plan for success, uh, something actually works and you don't have to rethink your delivery. But the other thing about it is that it didn't use the patient's own cells. So even though the eye is what we call immune privilege, you still have to um, take uh, um, anti-rejection drops. So uh, Pete and others now are, are using different approaches. We have a clinical trial with uh, uh, Stanley Chang at uh, Columbia Presbyterian, um, and this is going to be a um, my, my view, a, uh, a routine uh, procedure within the next very few years, less than five years, for macular degeneration, hopefully uh, retinitis pigmentosa and others. Um, it's very, very exciting. It's, uh, it's considered low-hanging fruit. Um, personalized clinical trials, uh, this wonderful uh, researcher, Masayo Takahashi, if if you're in New York and, uh, and feel like stopping in at our conference, October 25th, 27th, she's going to be speaking. Um, and she began the first uh, clinical trial. Now, Japan has uh, turned around its entire economy to focus on regenerative medicine, and they've actually redone their version of the FDA to facilitate trials. Um, and, and they allow you to go first for safety and uh, very, very fast, within 90 days, you get a review. Uh, and then if you pass that, you have to go for further review. But it kind of sounds um, faster than it actually is. So, um, but that's going ahead. They have chosen in Japan, they've decided it's too expensive to do trials with patients' um, own cells. Uh, you know, what we're doing is we're taking um, a little bit of blood and a little bit of skin. We're trying both. 
and we're taking the patient's own cells and turning it into uh, the um, uh, RPEs that are, are missing. Um, and then they don't need any immunosuppression. Um, but uh, Japan is not taking that, uh, that view. Um, there is a clinical trial for Parkinson's disease. Uh, I think many people know of deep brain stimulation. Um, again, there are those people who believe that deep brain stimulation works largely on a placebo effect. However, um, uh, some ex extraordinary researchers, uh, Lorenz Studer uh, here in New York at uh, Sloan Kettering, um, who is uh, one of the, the premier um, neuroscientists working with stem cells, um, and he's very lucky. His wife is a, uh, is a neurosurgeon, so you can only imagine their uh, dinner conversation. Um, but uh, I, I take great comfort because to have somebody who is, um, is actually going to be doing the surgery, uh, who regularly spends their time in people's brains, I think is fantastic. Um, and this is going to be one of the first uh, trials you're using pluripotent stem cells uh, at um, uh, the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. We are um, helping with that in a variety of ways. Um, mitochondrial replacement therapy. So mitochondrial DNA, something that may or may not have crossed uh, your, um, your newspaper or, or thinking. Um, that has traditionally been thought of as uh, something that's not important, kind of junk uh, DNA. Uh, and really just a battery pack of the cells. Well, it turns out that it's a lot more, and we think that as time goes by, we're going to see a tremendous amount of disease that actually is coming from defects in these energy cells. Uh, we, am, at our laboratory, uh, were able to replace uh, the mitochondria uh, that was defective in a, in a human egg. We did a swap. Um, with uh, a mom who has the disease in her family and didn't want to pass it on to her children. The results um, are devastating. The children, uh, if they survive, are severely, severely uh, impaired. Um, and uh, we found a way to, uh, to work with a donor egg that had healthy mitochondria, um, swap out the, uh, uh, the DNA from the woman whose mitochondria was defective, um, put it in the donor egg, take out the donor egg DNA, basically a swap, uh, kind of an IVF technique, and we were really excited about it. Um, and unfortunately, this is, this is a place where it did get bogged down, or it is still bogged down, and it, is, uh, it got confused, which happens a lot with stem cell research, um, in a policy conversation about three-parent babies and should, uh, is this going to encourage women who are 70 years old to have children? I don't know about you, but the idea <laughs> of that is just, horrifying to me. I mean, I cannot imagine a woman who would find that to be fantastic. Um, but in any event, the UK Parliament has uh, voted to approve that therapy in the UK, um, but we still are waiting. Uh, and then gene editing. So um, Feng Zhang, who is a NYSIF Robertson investigator, uh, we have investigators at our own laboratory and then all over the world. Um, so uh, there are three people who were uh, most recently involved in inventing this technique we call uh, gene editing and uh, uh, CRISPR. Uh, and uh, a woman in, uh, in California, a woman in Paris, and Feng Zhang, uh, who is uh, here in the US. And Feng, uh, the, the two women did their work in animals, and Feng said, well, let's see if we could do this in, in people. So basically, it's word processing. And it's word processing um, with a um, uh, manipulation of a molecular um, bacterial spizzy. So uh, if, if you think of kind of moving, moving your mouse, you would be moving your mouse and you would be controlling this molecular scissors and you could just, um, uh, uh, it identifies, this bacteria basically um, identifies things that shouldn't be there. And so it would say, okay, 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 uh, no, and, and then you would just trigger it and it just snips it out. So this has extraordinary, extraordinary promise. Um, immediately, Frankenstein kind of articles uh, uh, came up, but you know, for sickle cell anemia, for Tay-Sachs, uh, for all kinds of, um, of just really terrible diseases, uh, this actually is going to be going ahead in the UK, 
um, in uh, Duchenne's, uh, which is a very severe form of muscular uh, dystrophy, actually several dystrophies that affect boys. Um, and, uh, and Feng uh, is also going to be speaking at that same meeting. Um, he's, he's wonderful. He, he just lives this, and he's now developed an even more uh, precise technique. Um, uh, he's, he's terrific, very generous person. Um, CAR T cell therapy we talked about, and there are you know, multiple uh, trials uh, for different cancers. I am very, very, very eager, uh, as I'm sure all of you are, to see uh, it tried on ovarian and pancreatic cancer, and hopefully those will be the next two targets. Uh, so drug discovery, I mentioned, uh, using these pluripotent stem cells, how does that happen? We take a piece of skin or blood. We, we often try to use skin just because it's, um, it's easier to work with, but uh, we can do blood. And then we, uh, we do these um, tricks to it, and we turn it back into that, uh, that sort of predetermined state. Um, and then we can turn it into, through other tricks, into any cell type in the body. At this point, uh, we can make, um, and we'll be uh, publishing something shortly, all of the different uh, critical cells in the brain. And we can make cardiac cells, we can make liver cells, we can make kidney cells. It's very exciting. And most of the drug toxicity comes from either a neurological problem, a cardiac problem, or a liver or kidney problem. So to be able to test drugs in advance before they go to human trials and figure out who should and shouldn't get a drug at all, who shouldn't be in a trial, it's a new world. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Kevin Egan's work uh, was in 2008. Um, and so now, and I'm absolutely thrilled about this, um, we were able to go back and, uh, and search through existing drugs. Why is that a good thing? Because they're already on the market and they can be used by physicians for a different purpose. And so um, uh, we discovered an epilepsy drug uh, that protects the motor neurons. So that is the first step. Uh, that trial is, uh, if you know uh, people with this disease, um, there are many other centers, but the uh, uh, Hospital for Special Surgery is, uh, is now recruiting. Um, so. Stepping back, the New York Stem Cell Foundation and uh, why I got involved in stem cell research um, in 2004, um, we have a, a child with type 1 uh, diabetes, juvenile diabetes, and uh, so when he was diagnosed um, 23 years ago, uh, our, our world changed as it does when a, a chronic disease decides it's going to come and live in your family. And so I looked and my husband looked for um, all of the different ways that uh, we could to try to accelerate research. And in 2000, it really wasn't for me in 1998, but it was about in 2000, a little bit later, uh, when I became aware of stem cell research and I said, this is a, a new paradigm. This is going to change medicine as we know it. Um, and so um, I did what I knew how to do from my background, which is I, I wrote a business plan. And then I went and I talked to uh, uh, some folks and asked if, uh, if they thought if this wasn't a crazy idea, if they would help support it. Um, and I was very lucky. We got uh, some money. We got started, and that was 2005. Uh, I was uh, helped by a fantastic medical advisory board, uh, um, several Nobel laureates, Harold Varmus, uh, Paul Nurse, who was then heading up uh, Rockefeller, um, and, and others. And when we got together for our first meeting in August 2005, um, it was one of those steamy, hot, awful uh, New York evenings. Um, I said, what's the most important thing to do? And they said, we have, we have lost an entire uh, generation of researchers because they're being told, don't go into stem cell research. There's no money, there's no jobs, and there's personal insecurity. So the most important thing we can do is to actually make sure that we have scientists who are trained to do stem cell research. Um, so, uh, so we set up a program to do that. Uh, the other thing they thought was really important was to bang a drum loudly, um, even more so today, but certainly then. There is so much to pay attention to and to care and to fix. Um, but they felt it was really important, particularly also for clinicians as well as, uh, as lay people, to understand this is front and center. They need to make room for it in their mind. And then we needed to have a safe, 
Haven Laboratory, where the most advanced work could be done and the politics would just stay outside the door. So um, we have, in, uh, in the years since then, uh, grown a, a very substantial uh, pipeline of investigators. Um, this was taken last May out in Montauk. Uh, we have two um, uh, symposia a year. For This one is for five days, 60 scientific presentations. They start early in the morning. They go till late at night. Uh, and these are the inventors of uh, using optogenetics. Uh, Ed Boyden uh, won the big brain prize using light to turn the brain on and off. Uh, <clears throat> Winrich uh, Friedrich from, uh, from Rockefeller who is figuring out how, um, how babies understand uh, and, and can recognize facial expressions. Feng Zhang uh, on the right. And they become each other's best scientific friends and something else happens. They realize that they can work together they're not siloed, and they come together twice a year, and we have neuroscientists and stem cell scientists. They would normally never meet each other. It is extraordinary, and I think what was really best for um, uh, illustrated for me is that um, we had our first graduating class a year ago, and uh, Ravi Majetti doing uh, one of the first major uh, trials. It's called anti-CD47 out of Stanford, and it has, uh, with Irv Weissman, a, a amazing um, uh, mentor, uh, and basically they have uncovered for this group of blood cancers and they think beyond the mechanism by which cancer hides. And basically cancer puts an invisibility cloak because, you know, there's the garbage collection uh, that is happening continually in our bodies. And somehow uh, those macrophages miss what is going on with cancer cells. And so to simply uncloak them and say, uh, you don't belong here, out, uh, that's going to be extraordinary. Uh, the trials now are ongoing. Uh, they're, um, the, the results are fantastic with uh, infants who have a rare uh, and uncurable fatal form of uh, blood leukemia. And they will be expanding that. Um, and uh, uh, two other wonderful researchers, they graduated and they said, we want to come back. Can we pay to come back? And we said. You can't do that, but you could work. So uh, they all came back, and um, they worked with the, uh, the younger scientists and, uh, and now are part of an ongoing uh, program that we have. Um, and then our banging the drum loudly continues. Uh, Rockefeller has been our host from inception. Um, and uh, I was just speaking with the, uh, the former uh, head of Rockefeller, who's now the president of Stanford, and uh, he's going to try to come back for it this year, which I'm very happy about. Uh, and it's, um, this is a, it's a really wonderful event. Uh, if you decide to come, you should register early because it sells out and not, and expect to understand about 40% of what you hear, but that 40% is pretty fabulous. Uh, so the Safe Haven Laboratory that we started with five people, uh, or one person and then quickly five people, now has 45 full-time researchers. Um, we've invested uh, 160 million, a little more now, uh, in stem cell research, and, uh, and that is uh, essentially all philanthropy. Uh, so, so what do we do at this laboratory? Uh, because stem cell research now, thank goodness, is being done uh, at many major institutions all over the world. We're kind of the stem cell ninjas. So we're like the special ops. So we do very, very sophisticated uh, stem cell technology, and then we will partner as we did with Rockefeller or uh, Stanford or uh, you know, Oxford to take the research they're doing in a particular disease and then we apply these very advanced uh, techniques that um, they don't have access to and are not developed in a typical laboratory. So um, by having this, um, this research model, which we developed by accident but now by intent, uh, and having this global community focusing only on the kind of high risk, high reward, tipping point experiments that are really going to change everybody's boat. If it's being done well at another institution, we don't touch it. Um, and being independent has had tremendous uh, value and we share as much as we can, um, which is not, doesn't happen as often as it should. Um, and so uh, we think it's important to be very open to not have a favorite cell type. Our favorite cell type is the one that works. Um, and we think that different ones are going to work for different things. 
Uh, so it, we have a very open mind approach. Uh, we do drug discovery, we create human disease models, and then we develop proprietary um, technologies because it simply was, um, was essential for the field. Uh, and in order to do that, we had to bring on bioengineers and industrial engineers and computer scientists. Um, and so our laboratory looks uh, very different than a traditional laboratory. And we have a very, very large collection of stem cells. If you work in an academic lab, you will uh, be working with um, uh, your, your stem cell core may have uh, a couple of dozen uh, stem cell lines. A line is a stem cell made from one person. We have thousands. Um, stem cell funding, funding, as I mentioned, uh, you know, one year you can do it, one year you can't with, uh, with federal funding. I, I, I hope uh, we'll be able to, you know, have good federal funding, but who knows. Um, and so we found that uh, for especially the kind of cutting edge work that we do, which the NIH does not typically um, uh, support, uh, having private philanthropy has been essential. So one of the challenges that we decided to take on was, uh, okay, we now have these great stem cells, but they're being made by hand, like bread or, you know, fruitcake. They're not standardized. Um, they're being made from uh, a few people, so they certainly don't represent ethnic diversity at all or genetic diversity. And it takes a very long time to make a stem cell, um, and in order to, to do it, uh, you basically have to take a highly trained person who spends half a day, every single day, seven days a week, for three months, uh, simply making the stem cell line, and then another two months doing the quality control and, uh, and differentiation. And the problem with that is um, you've got really smart people doing something that's really boring. So what do they do? They get creative. And, uh, and that's a problem because you really want the aspirin that you take out of the bottle today to be the same <coughs> as the aspirin you take out of the bottle tomorrow. So uh, we work in these different areas. Often we are partnering, uh, I, I would say we are partnering with um, uh, major institutions and clinicians uh, all over the world um, to do this work. These are just some uh, cells for you to see on the bottom right. That's cardiac cells. Those are from a human being, and that's the uh, rhythm of their heart. Uh, the four brain neurons in the upper left, um, that we have uh, electrophysiology that shows um, the electrical activity in the neurons. And the beta cells, the, uh, the orange, is um, uh, the reaction to uh, insulin. So basically trying to use this technology to, uh, uh, to, to fuse um, the knowledge that we have from the human genome and put it in a biological context. So it's not just A, C, T's, and G's. It's not just an app. You actually have a smartphone reading it. And to be able to anticipate how this is personalized medicine, to understand how people from different genetic backgrounds are going to react to a drug, uh, tailor what we call efficacy, which means does it work, to genotype and predictive medicine and then also to represent global diversity because we're all different and as Roots and, uh, and other programs have showed us, um, we're all a lot different uh, often than we think we are. So um, this has been a, a winning model. It's great. We're really thrilled at uh, a lot of the work that we've been able to do. And um, it's international. This is, uh, you know, disease has no border and, uh, you know, great, great work, great science uh, is, is international, although um, it's very interesting, the U.S. approach is, is quite different. We are moving to a new home uh, in January. It'll be easier for people to see us. We'll be on 54th Street. And absolutely none of this would be possible without the work of our board. So thank you very much. And if I understand correctly, it's technically possible to take a little bit of my skin and from it develop any number of organs. Uh, any number of cells, a few early stage organs. But that can then be developed into various, various different organs. So what people are trying now, the question is, can we use stem cells to create organs? The answer is, yes, we can. Mm -hmm. It's very early days. So the first thing to do is to stop working in flat plastic dishes and, uh, and start working in 3D, right, because we're alive in 3D. And then what we call co-culturing, mixing a lot of different types of cells together. 
and actually creating what we call uh, embroid bodies or organoids. Mm -hmm. So we're not quite at organs, we're at organoids, but pretty soon we're going to be at organs, the simpler ones. So h how far are we, maybe in decades, to be able to create personalized spare part, uh, spare personalized spare part deposits that uh, do not have any rejection problems because it's our own skin. And what are the ethical issues with something like that? Well, we could start another hour answering the question of uh, uh, sort of specifically uh, what we can expect. So what I would say is in the next three to five years, you will be able to go to a major medical center uh, or possibly, depending on who it is and where they are, your physician, and be treated with cell therapy for various forms of uh, eye disease and blindness, including macular degeneration. That is real. That's in progress. Um, we also now, we in our lab um, and others using different techniques, are able to make bone. Uh, we're able to make bone from your own skin cells or blood cells. So what does that mean if you, you have a traumatic accident or uh, in the case of pediatric uh, sarcoma, children with cancers, um, if, if you can have a, a biological implant that's your own material and it's made in the shape of that defect and it grows with you, you don't have to have annual surgeries. That's real too. How about cartilage? So cartilage, very interesting. Um, there are, there's a report that just came out in Australia of cartilage being, uh, being made in that laboratory. And uh, so what happens is when somebody publishes a great result, um, it then has to be replicated. So we're hopeful. Thank you. Hi. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the difference between stem cell therapy and immunotherapy? And I know that immunotherapy is being used now for certain cancers, but I'm wondering if, there, uh, if there's any hope for them being used for neurodegenerative disease as well. So um, the outlook for neurodegenerative disease and uh, in cell replacement therapy uh, is we feel pretty strong in, uh, in Parkinson's disease. Uh, that's a very good place to start because the disease is actually fairly simple for complex neurological disease, it's um, uh, an absence of the uh, uh, critical amount of dopamine. So uh, those trials uh, have begun in other countries, um, and uh, as I mentioned, a very promising trial um, is going to be recruiting shortly uh, in New York. And the immunotherapy? The immunotherapy, immunotherapy is, um, is uh, basically um, souping up the body's own immune system, and then uh, directing it to a particular target. So arm stem cell therapy, yes, it's a type of stem cell that you arm to do that. It's a T cell. It's uh, it's your immune regulatory cell. But um, so it's a uh, cancer uh, stem cells are an immunotherapy or stem cell therapy. Uh, bone marrow transplantation is stem cell therapy as well. I wonder. Um, I, I really, I don't, I don't have a view of that. I really have been looking at where you can get the best treatment now. And at a clinicaltrial.gov, uh, it should be free. So you can't do better than that. Uh, where does the United States rank internationally in terms of stem cell research and funding? Are we leading? Are we in the middle? Are we lagging behind other countries? And if we are lagging, why is it? So we are, we are leading, but barely, and we're neck and neck with, I would say, Japan and the UK. They have abundant funding. We have very, very, very scarce funding. It's a tremendous problem, and we are losing researchers all the time to other countries. California had a $3 billion bond initiative uh, about 10 years ago, and um, that bond initiative is running out uh, in the next two or three years, um, and the transformation has been incredible. I think it's several things. Uh, 
overall funding for medical research is way down. And so uh, stem cell research is, uh, is not going to uh, escape that. Uh, stem cell research, because it has been so inappropriately conflated uh, with um, uh, you know, ideological uh, questions uh, has suffered particularly. And then the kind of stem cell research that is really going to move the needle, it's new. And unfortunately, and particularly in a scarce funding environment, the NIH is, is trying to keep its researchers with very large teams um, who have been going for years afloat. So, you know, the new investigator, the young investigator, the, uh, our, our technology now, which is, uh, you know, world-leading uh, advances for researchers all, all over, um, we tried uh, to, uh, to get an NIH grant for that in 2008, and we, they didn't even score us. We were triaged out. Um, I'm very pleased to say we're now working with Dr. Francis Collins' lab. Um, but, you know, it took, took a long time. Uh, I had a question about Lyme disease. Is there any research being done with stem cells for Lyme disease? I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're well aware of how the problems are with that, and I've been sick with the disease, diagnosed in my spinal fluid and in my blood for over 21 years now, along with the co-infections with Bicosis, Bartonella, and Mycoplasma fermentans. So what can you tell me about that? Well, the first thing is it really is, um, it is absolutely astounding to me that um, particularly given the resources in the communities that have been hardest hit uh, by Lyme disease, um, why there isn't abundant funding for Lyme disease research. I don't understand it at all. Um, as far as a stem cell approach to it, um, it we have, uh, we're, we're now working with the Zika virus. Uh, we have made models. Um, of Lyme disease, but you know, Ly there's Lyme disease and Lyme disease and Lyme disease, right? It's not just uh, one disease. Um, and and it, is, it appears to be, as a spirochete, it's much more like, um, uh, it, it, it does, it's not, it's very complex. Uh, so there should be huge efforts. Uh, what stem cell research can do right now is to show it, to basically give a canvas that then different approaches can be tried on. The why is um, the uh, use of immunotherapy uh, for solid tumors lagging behind the blood cancers? The blood cancers are easier. They're easier to access, and they're easier to, um, to arm the T cells for. Uh, the, the solid tumors are, um, it, when you have, a, when you have the, the blood that's circulating and you're only trying to deal with, with basically uh, you know, one particular kind of cell, it's really straightforward. The solid tumors are located in many different places. They're made of very different kinds of cells, and you have to get through difficult barriers. Uh, and I think there also is a, a concern. It, it will be a very high risk trial when those trials start. Um, but we're optimistic. I, I think the smartest people in cancer research that uh, we're aware of in the world are working on this, and um, they are cautiously optimistic. It's just, it's just harder. What do you think of uh, the um, Einstein and Mount Sinai embryonic stem cell labs uh, being shut down, for harvesting labs being shut down? Embryonic stem cell labs? No. Um, we work with Einstein and we work with Mount Sinai. Um, it's, I'm not, I'm not aware, aware of that. that. Okay, thank you. Diabetes, family example. Um, some drug companies are making a fortune for everyone ever selling drugs that everybody has to take every day if they have diabetes. Do you get, and a lot of illnesses are like that. Do you get pushback from drug companies who lose a huge market if these new therapies solve the problem? So the question that you, that you actually, the next question is, how do we get drug companies and insurance companies, the payers, to, um, how do we incent them to curative therapies, right, as opposed to the, the razor blades that they're selling all of the time? And uh, there are a number of, uh, of people who are much more knowledgeable than I am uh, about tax incentives 
uh, that are, are looking at how you can incent an insurance company that typically is retaining somebody for three years, how do you incent them to uh, uh, pay a lot of money to cure someone when instead they could you know, pay much less money and just take care of somebody for three years? That actually is pretty straightforward. For the drug companies, um, a number of them have tried. There are a number of approaches in the diabetes world, for example. You not only have to uh, supply the uh, insulin-producing cells that are being destroyed because the body has misidentified uh, uh, self as foreign, but it's an autoimmune disease. So if you simply were to take those uh, uh, beta cells and put them back into the body, they would be destroyed again and, and possibly uh, with a substantial immune response. So there are a number of kind of shots on goal for that. Uh, there's the magic tea bag approach. People have been trying that since Ben was diagnosed. You wrap them in, you name it. Uh, everything from algae to uh, much more sophisticated uh, materials now. Um, that may work. What we're particularly excited about, and we actually convened an immunoengineering meeting a year ago uh, to just kind of wake up and say the emperor has no clothes. We can talk about uh, transplanting cells for diabetes all we want, but until we deal with the immune system, it's a stupid pet trick. And so we think the way to do it actually is to look at it from the cell's perspective. And how can you either modulate the immune system very, very, very selectively, and the immune system's really smart and it keeps changing. So is there a very, very specific switch that you could dial, that you could turn, so that the uh, immune attack will stop without immunosuppressives? Because we know immunosuppressives work, but they bring a whole host of other issues. Or is it possible to actually change the, um, the skin, if you will, of, of those cells so that uh, they are not recognized? Think about it, it's the flip. It's what anti CD47 uh, or PDL1, those are the cancer immunotherapies. What they're trying to do is make those cancers visible by removing the invisibility cloak. So, what we're looking at is what can we learn from that to cloak them? Is there stem cell research uh, focused on multiple myeloma? Yes. And there is. Wh what's the outlook on that? Um, well, actually, and this is. Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty exciting. Uh, you may or may not be aware of um, uh, Kathy Giusti. She's a um, patient advocate. She's had uh, multiple myeloma herself for a very long time. And uh, this is where the patient voice um, has had tremendous impact. She actually has single-handedly, and now with a, uh, her advocacy group, been responsible for getting a couple of significant therapy, uh, drug therapies to market and uh, they're funding good work, so. Okay. Um, to produce, I have a, a rather, mm, a little bit specific question. I just was reading a little bit and I, I just, uh, I'm curious how your institute uh, is working on this. Uh, to produce, uh, induce uh, pluripotent uh, stem, stem cells, uh, you, uh, one of the method is to uh, add to the mixture of, a cell, of those cells, like skin cells, for example, transcription factors, some, some specific transcription factors that they change, uh, they allow to or open DNA and so uh, to, to the access to the DNA. And some of those uh, trans, uh, transcription factors, they are uh, oncogens or pro-oncogens. Uh, genes, uh, pro oncogenes genes, and how you deal, because um, the first research papers that I just briefly uh, look at uh, the f uh, from the 2006 uh, when this Japanese uh, scientist was uh, uh, discovering and, uh, and tra um, transforming cells to uh, induce stem cells, uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, they concluded that uh, when they are injected those cells to the subcutaneous to the mouse, the mouse c uh, could create tumors. So w how do you deal now that you avoid this uh, situation right. because so it's very dangerous? So as I mentioned, uh, when Shinya Yamanaka made that discovery, the gene he used, the transcription factor, was something called C-MIC, which Harold Varmus uh, first, uh, with, and Mike Bishop, uh, discovered, got the Nobel Prize for, and it's the first oncogene. So 100% of the time, if you use CMIC, 
you are going to develop cancer in whatever you're putting CMIC into. It's not 50%, it's 100%. So fortunately, we've gotten smarter um, in the last uh, 10 years, and we figured out how to use things other than oxygen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.